Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's 12 noon by my time, and I think I want to keep to time, as we are known for. We always try to keep to time. To time. I am very excited being here this afternoon for yet another session of our bi-weekly webinar at the Center of Excellence in Migration and Global Studies of the National Open University of Nigeria. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor of our university, Professor Olufemi Peters, I welcome you all to this platform. I'm excited seeing some very um, important dignitaries here this afternoon. Everybody is important actually, but I want to just quickly recognize one or two persons before I go on to the presentation proper. I have seen our presenter of the day, that's the most important person here right now, Professor uh, Olakweba. You are welcome, sir. I can also see here two former vice chancellors. One, let me start from home, Professor Abdallah Obadamu, who was our former immediate past vice chancellor of the National Open University of Nigeria. You are welcome, sir. And Professor Iduwola Yikinka, the, also the immediate past vice chancellor of the University of Ibadan, my Ama Mata. You are welcome, sir. And mm -hmm. I can see here too our emeritus, Professor Sogolo. He's always here with us and always very punctual. You are welcome, sir. And so many other professors I am seeing. Please pardon me if I cannot pick your name now. But I must say, we are very excited to have you all on this platform. So without much waste of time, I, I also believe that very soon, our VC may be able to join, but he's very busy with some other assignments and promise that he will be around. So we are still expecting him if he can. But for his tight schedule, if he cannot, we have to excuse him. So today, yes. We are going to have an exciting moment today because I know that we are having somebody here who is going to share knowledge with us and make us enlightened at the end of the presentation of today. But before I go to introduce the speaker for today, I want to quickly brief you about this center, Center of Excellence in Migration and Global Study was uh, established about three years ago now by Tech Fund uh, Seed Fund under the tenor of our immediate past vice chancellor, Professor Uba Adamu. And the center is, um, was established to handle migration and global issues. So its mission is to provide sustainable leverage for interdis interdisciplinary research in migration and global studies. And uh, its mandates, um, of the, of the mandates of the center, the center serves as a fulcrum for research about migrations, both internal and external, and its conceptualization, contextualization, and decolonization as essential to global studies. It is a hinge of evidence-based research about pressing and emerging migration challenges in Nigeria, Africa, and the globe. Other mandation-driven research to serve as agents of national and global policy in migration studies, seeks to seek grants for academic activities and outreach, organize short courses, seminars, conferences, and public lectures, publish and sustain peer-reviewed academic journal and monographs in the field. It will seek and execute all memoranda of understanding with partners. And so this center has been on and trying to meet its mandates, part of which is what we are doing today in this uh, center. I must tell you that um, we have our journal of, uh, which is called International Journal of Migration and Global Studies. Now we are entering the third volume, first issue, and um, we have the seminars and we are also planning other trainings we are going to start training soon for postgraduate diploma in migration studies. We are on it and many more. So the center is working strong under the tenor of 
our current vice chancellor, Professor Lufemi Peters, and I am Gloria Aneto, the director of the center. So you are all very much welcome. Today, a very big scholar is going to discuss with us, and that is Professor, or, uh, Professor Peter Olamakinde Olakbega of the Social Sciences Faculty in the University of Ibadan. So let me quickly say a little about his CV because his CV is a textbook. So there's no way I can really say everything about this uh, erudite scholar this afternoon. But let me just tell you a bit about him. Professor Olama Kinde Olakwegba is a professor of applied social psychology in the University of Ibadan, Nigeria. And he also trained in that university, all his degrees in University of Ibadan, that great institution. He's a full professor with, which uh, was with effect from 1st October, 2014. He has over 100 publications comprising of books, chapters in books, and articles in internationally reputable peer-reviewed journals. He was a visiting scholar to Adekunle Ajashin University, Akumba Akoko, in 2011, postdoctoral fellow at the Northwest University, Mafi Gang, South Africa, in 2012, recipient of the ICP slash Change Fellowship Research Grant from Jacobson Foundation, Canada, University of Ibadan Senate Research Grant, and the focal person from Nigeria for the Moment of Change Research Grant Project, a multi-country research coordinated by the University of Bath, United Kingdom. Professor Olakbeba has also served and still serving his university in various capacities, which include undergraduate coordinator, postgraduate coordinator, sub-dean postgraduate, faculty of the social sciences, member of Senate, member of several Senate and Joint Council and Senate committees, dean, faculty of the social sciences, member selection board for the appointment of vice chancellor in 2021, and currently the director, office of alumni relations. Peter Olakbegba is, Estana examiner to the University of Lagos, University of Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, University of Fort Hare, South Africa, Ekiti State University, University of Lagos, and Estana assessor to several universities within and outside Nigeria. Professor Awebba is a fellow of the Nigerian Psychological Association and several professional bodies, including American Psychological Association, Nigerian uh, Psychological Association, I've said that, Society of Pen Personality and Social Psychology, Nigerian Association of Psychologists, International Association of Psychology, and to, that's just to mention a few, the list continues endlessly. He is currently a member of the University of Ibadan Governing Council, Precious Cornerstone University Governance Board, Pan-African University Institute of Life and Earth Sciences, and was a member of the Governing Council, the Ibarakpa Polytechnic Eruwa, or your state. He is the editor-in-chief, ASU Journal of Social Sciences, member, editorial advisory board, Journal of Cultural Analysis and Social Change, Editor, Journal of Positive Psychology and Counseling, Member, Editorial Board, African Journal of Psychological, Psychological Study of Social Issues, among others. So I would like to stop here because we can continue to tomorrow, but let's go to the business of the day. This erudite scholar is going to discuss with us today the brain, uh, sorry, brain drain or brain gain. Nigerian academics and the Jackpa syndrome. You know, on this platform, we've had many Jackpa syndrome discussion, but I know with today's own, it's going to go in a special way because we have somebody who is 
a guru in the field. So join me to welcome Professor Peter Olama Kinde Olakbegba. You are welcome, sir. And you have been made a co-host to share your screen. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Director, for your kind words and for the invitation. And um, I want to salute all eminent uh, professors in the house, our, our living ancestors. Uh, I must make particular mention of Professor Sogunu, uh, our living ancestor uh, at the University of Gadi. Of course, again, I want to uh, recognize the presence of the immediate vice chancellor of the uh, University of Abuja, of the National University, rather, and the main vice chancellor of uh, the University of Abuja, Professor Duro Uh Let me start on a note of appreciation uh, by appreciating the director of the Center of Excellence and the management team of that center, and of course, by extension, uh, the National Open University for giving me this platform to share my thoughts on this very important uh, discussion. Uh, well, let me give you a bit of background. Well, let's consider this as work in progress uh, because I decided to do a quick research in response to the invitation extended to me. Uh, right. on, this, on this platform, were actually uh, part of the respondent because I was done between just presenting uh, a position paper, um, presenting an empirical paper. So I decided to, uh, to go empirical. Uh, then we decided to design this study and of course, we share questionnaire online and all of that. So I'm sharing part of the uh, data that we already have in. Like I said, it's work in progress. And of course, I want to appreciate the center uh, for stimulating my interest to carry out uh, this research. A again, some, uh, some weeks ago, we had one very interesting discussion on the platform of the Senior Staff Club of the University of Bali. Uh, and of course, because um, a particular agency in Nigeria uh, starting responsibility of, uh, of um, certifying teachers uh, and uh, satisfying them professionally uh, got a landmark achievement uh, because the, uh, the body in the, in the UK said anybody from Nigeria who is certified by that agency is then free to teach in the, uh, in the United Kingdom without taking any qualifying examination uh, in the United Kingdom. So there was this very stimulating discussion. Some people are saying, saying ah, brain drain, now it is our secondary school teachers and first school teachers who now begin to immigrate and all of that. And of course, the register of that particular agency said, no, it is brain drain. We cannot be talking about brain drain again, again. We had that interesting discussion on that platform. And of course, when I got this inv invitation, my interest became very stimulated. And look, can we just look at it? What we are experiencing in Nigeria, is it brain drain? or brain gain. Uh, well, that is uh, what led me into uh, conducting uh, this which is is still ongoing. Now, when we talk of brain drain, uh, brain drain is the migration of skilled human resources. Of course, it is, it is not new. Uh, movement across borders is not new. People move every time looking for greener pastures and all of that. Uh, and of course, you will remember that sometimes in the 80s, uh, up to early 90s, uh, it was the turn of medical doctors to migrate heavily because Saudi Arabia opened its doors. And so many doctors and so many uh, medical lecturers actually located from Nigeria to uh, Saudi Arabia there. Now, it is otherwise known as human capital flights. Uh, that is the emigration or immigration of individuals who have received advanced training at home. And of course, that is one point we need to, uh, to uh, look at very critically. Now, for people that are moving, they have been trained in their country of, of origin. And of course, when you look at it, in Nigeria, uh, when you look at our university education in Nigeria, it's almost as if we are going to the university for free because the government is actually training us for free. Of course, when government are then trained people, uh, because let, let me quickly say this. In, in Nigeria, it is uh, cheaper to attend a federal university than to attend uh, a private nursery and primary school. It is way cheaper in the university than in the uh, nursery and primary school. So why do you go to, to university, federal, uh, government university for that matter? And having been trained by this government, they emigrate 
to other clients. I begin to ask whether that is a dream or a gain. Uh, I, I, would, I would say that, say that. See, emigration comes at a cost to both the sending and the receiving countries. And that is, that is, that is the truth. Of course, uh, my former best so is in the house today. What is, tell you, when, you say, when you say something is free, that thing is free to the extent that someone else is paying for it. So emigration, when you look at it, comes at the cost to both the sending and the receiving countries. Now, for the sending, for the receiving country, the net benefit is breaking. Now, if you look at the UK, now, look at Canada now, receiving people from Nigeria, to them it's a gain. But the net cost to the sending country is a drain. Because the sending country, uh, for all that we care, has expended money training these people. But then they've crossed the border uh, to go and be useful in another country. Now, when you look at Nigerian academics and our popularity, Nigerian academics are a critical population who have marked influence on education and society. And one can begin to imagine uh, a country without uh, academics. We all know what that kind of country uh, would be. Uh, as academics, we generate knowledgeable citizens, uh, train future leaders and future academics, and support the higher education uh, system. Now, when I look at this all together, I, I conclude by saying that generally in Nigeria, the university is preoccupied with human capital development and research development. That is what we do. We, we train human capital for the countries. And of course, not just for countries now, we train human capital for the world. Because now our product can go anywhere in the world and begin to apply the knowledge gain in our university, wherever they go to. Now, but when you look at life of academics, as interesting as it ought to be, you realize that academics generally struggle with burnout because there are so many things to do, especially in this line uh, in Nigeria. So many things to do, and of course, the facility to do them are almost not there. So we struggle with burnout, lack of work-life balance. Now, many of us, we throw out ourselves into our, into our jobs and all of that, and of course, some other things suffer. I, I, I'll tell you a quick real-life uh, story here. Uh, my second son is a investor undergraduate now. When it was in primary three or primary four, I can't uh, really recollect really. Uh, they were teaching them in class and they said, look, um, families should sit together, they should eat together, watch television together. And my little boy raised this and I said, it's, it's not possible in our house. And the teacher said, what do you mean? He said, my daddy, office, laptop, church. <laughs> I mean, that is our life. So many of us don't have any other life apart from academics. So the work-life balance is actually an issue for us. And of course, we also struggle with mental health, uh, mental health problems, among other things that we, we struggle with as academics. Now, this DAPA syndrome, which is simply just emigration. Now, in recent times, there have been a high surging movement of academics out of Nigeria. Uh, and of course, it, it, is, it is alarming because now it's almost at a, uh, an epidemic stage. People are just moving. Academics are moving, uh, masters and professional students are moving, and all of that. And of course, it is in response to something. Now, UK has thrown its, uh, its, its, uh, its, its, its gates open. Canada is also attracting people, and all of that. It, it's, I don't think it's been this, it's been this, this serious. Now, the country is generally regarded as a major sufferer of the brain drain. Whatever is the gain to the UK, to me, is a drain to Nigeria. Now, literature has alluded to a plethora of general social causes of brain drain, and they include mass unemployment, poor salaries, anyway, of course, uh, this really, really speaking to our situation. I did a little calculation this morning, and I realized that a, a professor in Nigeria, the highest professor in Nigeria, is taking something like $620. So that's, that, that shows how poor our salaries are. Now, another cause is poor working conditions. Our working conditions are uh, nothing to write home about. Uh, we have a situation at Nigerian universities that professors are in cubicles. In fact, not just in cubicles, they are sharing cubicles. In some universities, you cannot really uh, access the internet. In fact, as I'm speaking, I'm using the university in internet, but you realize I'm joining with you 
uh, with, with two, two, two uh, million. Uh, one as a backup from my, from my own data. So no facilities to, uh, to work with. The working conditions are not that good. Well, if you are uh, mass poverty, if a professor earns less than seven hundred dollars, then can they imagine what an Nasa lecturer is, um, is, is, um, is earning? Mass poverty, religious crisis, worsen economic and political conditions, lack of quality education, and of course, again, it's something, uh, something also that we have to look at. Uh, because it's a mistake to just realize that people who have access to, to, to school and not access to education. Now, there are some dispositions of regular causes of immigration. One we call international education mobility readiness. Of course, this is measured by the desire to immigrate, the intention, the expectation, and the willingness. Uh, and again, motivating factors also is uh, some are motivated to go for further studies, uh, others to experience a new life. And of course, and this is interesting, we're going to see this in the data, pressure from family and friends. Now, John, John Burnout as a major psychological issue. A whole lot of academics are, are, are actually battling with job burnout. Now, the well-being of today's Nigerian academics affect the well-being of the society tomorrow. And that's the point we need to take note of. Now, if academics are experiencing burnout, it will definitely affect their productivity. It will affect the quality of their teaching, it will affect the quality of their supervision. Now, the academic profession is approaching a collective nervous breakdown because people are working under intense pressure. Now, you, you can imagine the universities were locked down for like seven and a half months. And of course, again, you know, we were not paid for, for this month. But the fact of the matter is this. Now we are back in school. We are under pressure to cover lost ground. And of course, there's no way you, you, you put yourself under this kind of tremendous pressure that burnout will not come in. So everybody, the, the academic profession is approaching a collective nervous breakdown. You also agree with me that uh, there, there's, there's, there's overload of work because to employ just one lecturer in any federal university today can actually take you up to one year. Or in some instances, more than one year. The, the vice chancellor will have to keep moving from his base to Abuja from one office to the other because we need to employ one academic staff. And of course, people retire on a daily basis. People leave, people are immigrating. Now, the few people on ground now have to carry the whole load. So we can begin to see the sources of the burnout that we are talking about. Of course, people cannot go to leave uh, or go and leave the way they want to go because there's nobody to cover for them. Academic appears to suffer greater level of stress than comparable occupational groups. Some people have not been able to go to, on leave for six, seven, eight years. I mean, when I was doing someone, when I was in my faculty, somebody wanted to go on leave, and the government said, no, you can't go on leave because there's nobody to teach that course that you are teaching. Now, the Nigerian academic, academics face considerable and unique pressure in, the, in their line of duty. Then we look at another uh, component of our well-being, which is subjective well-being. Now, this is conceptualized as individuals' community and affective evaluations of their lives. When we talk to people now, how, 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 how do you feel? We'll begin to hear tears because when people cannot even meet basic, uh, basic needs, meet needs of their families, then their subjective well being is compromised and they really soon. Those with high subjective well being have high levels of positive emotions in teaching, high personal accomplishment in their role as teacher, and high overall life satisfaction. Of course, when your subjective well being is high, you are motivated. When you feel good with, with your life, you feel good with yourself, you feel good with your job, you feel good with your income, you are motivated to work, you are motivated to impact lives. Now, what are the theoretical frameworks we, uh, we decide to use for this study? Two, two, two theories came to mind. Uh, there are two theories of motivation. The first one is Maslow hierarchy of needs. Of course, we we'll discussed that in, 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 in just a while. Then also, the equity theory by Adams, 1963. Now, these are two interesting theories of motivation. For Maslow, human needs are arranged hierarchically and in order of importance. Of course, what Maslow did was to cluster human needs into five basic categories. Now, the lower order needs must be satisfied before the higher order needs. Now, let's look at what Maslow said those needs are. According to Maslow, these are the five needs 
physiological needs, safety needs, love and belonging needs, esteem needs, and self actualization. Now, according to him, you cannot pursue this thing simultaneously. You need to pursue one that is most important to you at that point in time. Now, according to Maslow, physiological need is at the base of the hierarchy. Why self actualization is at the very top. Now, let's look at the diagram. This Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, what are physiological needs? Physiological needs are actually the need for food, the need for water, the need for sex, and all those uh, physiological kind of things you need to satisfy. According to him, you cannot begin to think of moving on to safety, to other safety, safety when you have not satisfied your physiological needs. So according to him, you need to satisfy physiological needs. When you can take food for granted, you can take water for granted, you can take sex for granted, that is when you begin to think of safety. And when I teach my students in class and I teach them this, I, I, I give them this example. I said, look, here is a man who is jobless, who is looking for a job. He, he lives in the slum and he lives in a one room in the slum. Well, maybe with, with mattress or with mat and all that. That man is not thinking of safety. In fact, the door to the room does not have a key. The man is motivated to seek what to eat. But if the man gets a job and is able to buy a good mattress, able to buy a transfer, able to buy a television, to begin to think of how to secure the room where he lives. As a point in time, he may want to live out, move out of the neighborhood. So the, the theory of motivation by, by Maslow is that, is that our needs are in hierarchical order. And you satisfy one before you move to the other. What is the implication? The implication is that major academics, they have their needs. And if the needs are not satisfied where they are, then they will need to move to look for how to satisfy the needs. So for colleagues who are immigrating, they are immigrating because their needs they need to meet in Nigeria, which they cannot do for one reason or the other. But they need to, to go look it uh, for where they can go. Of course, at the top of the hierarchy, you have self-actualization. Uh, I won't dwell on that, but it's just to point out that there are needs. And in, in, in a bit to satisfy the needs, we look for how and where to satisfy them. So for those who are immigrating, we cannot blame them. They want to satisfy their needs. And of course, until you get to a place where you think you are self-actualized, you, you keep seeking. Then we have the equity theory by Adam Science 63. Now, this is a process model of motivation. Uh, and the basic thing there is that equality and fairness at the basis for comparison. In other words, as an employee, as a worker somewhere, you want to compare yourself with your coworkers or with people who are doing similar things like yourself. Now, the key elements of the theory are input, outcome, and comparison level. In, in other words, at that level, what you are trying to do is look, what am I putting in my input into the investment in terms of my research, in terms of my teaching, in terms of my community service. Those are my input. Now, I need to now look at my input against my outcome. What do I get in return as a professor? Less than six hundred dollars a month. I am comparing that. Look, is my outcome okay, given the input I'm putting in? I do that at one level. At another level, I begin to compare my input with the input of someone else, maybe with the input of someone in South Africa who is doing a similar job, and the output of that person. Now, the issue, the, the, the issue is, if I feel that my input is more than the out, output I'm getting, uh, the, is more than the outcome, then there's a feeling of inequity, inequity, because my input is more than my outcome. Now, I need also to compare with another person that is putting in the same kind of thing I'm putting in. Is the fellow getting a better outcome? If that fellow is getting a better outcome, again, I also feel that, look, there's no equity on this job. And of course, you know that will lead to, to, to stress within. Now, the theory demonstrates that the individuals are concerned both with their own rewards and also with what others get in their comparison. Now, that was why, years back when, um, I think that was probably around um, 2000 and now, there about, when ASU was negotiating with government, they were talking in terms of the African average. We are Nigeria and Nigerian country, but here we are talking of African average. What ASU was simply doing was, look, let us compare what we get with what people are doing similar or identical job 
in other countries in Africa, what they get. That is what the equity theory uh, is talking about. Now, employees expect a fair and equitable return for their contribution to their jobs. So everybody feels, look, if I'm contributing to so amount, there should be fairness and equity in what I get in return. Look at this statement. When people begin to make this kind of statement, then you should know what they are pushing at. Abel earns more than me, but I don't see him doing much work. Now this fellow is saying, look, the, out, the outcome, what we earn is the same thing, but this other fellow is not working as much as I'm working in this organization. Now, another one says, I get less salary compared to Abel, but his play, his place, this place needs me more than him. This individual is saying, look, we get the same salary, but I'm more important to this organization than this fellow. The fellow is trying to say that, look, then I should get more money than this other fellow. Now, you can see this diagram. So what we do, according to the key theory, is all of us, we place ourselves on the balance, and we have a comparison order uh, that we are, we, are, we are comparing ourselves with. Of course, if, if we weigh the same thing, there's feeling of equity. But if you do not wait, if the other well fellow is getting more than we're getting, while we put in the same thing, then there is a feeling of inequity. Now, the, what, are, what are we trying to have achieve in this research? What are the factors motivating Nigerian academics to emigrate? We are the preferred destination countries for Nigerian academics. How satisfies the academic life in Nigeria? What are the emotional costs and consequences of working? in the academia. Well, I would say we investigated. We are still investigating. I, I told you this is work in progress. Relationship between immigration and the passenger, job burnout and subjective well-being among Nigerian academics using descriptive and uh, inferential statistics. Now, these instruments that we use in collecting our data, uh, we use the general mobility readiness scale by autumn 2004 uh, to measure the job passenger that is the immigration syndrome. Then job, job burnout was measured using uh, the old bug burnout inventory, 2010. Then subjective well-being was measured with a subjective well-being life satisfaction scale by Dina et al. And of course, we consider certain social demographic variables like age, gender, relationship status, uh, number of direct dependents, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, the methodology. This is a cross-sectional survey. And the population of studies, academic staff in Nigerian universities. When we pushed out the, the online um, questionnaire, 279 academics responded. And of course, this is impressive because we only we pushed it out for just one week. So in one week, we got 279 academics that responded uh, to the questionnaire. Uh, sampling technique, we use, we use purposive sampling and snowball. Uh, let me try to explain that. Purposive because we predetermined the people wanted to sample, uh, wanted to sample Nigeria academics, which means we then to send our questionnaire directly to them or to platform uh, where we have strictly uh, uh, academic staff. Uh, and Snowball, because we also encourage us to give uh, or send to colleagues, we also encourage that they should also help us to push out to other uh, colleagues. Now the procedure for data collection, the world e-questionnaire e using Google Forms, uh, we designed a questionnaire on Google Form and we sent uh, distributed electronically among the Nigerian academics via WhatsApp. And of course, one interesting thing is we, we didn't push it just within our, our domain, we pushed it uh, to, to other states for the federation where we uh, encourage colleagues to uh, assist us uh, in distributing to other academic staff. Now, what are the results? Well, the age range of respondents was 25 to 76. When we look at, we need to interview that data to say, why do we have 76? Uh, 70 is the, is the retirement of academics. Well, we then realize that some emeritus professors are also on this platform. And of course, they could also, and of course, uh, we could have academic staff who are contract staff in some other places also responded. That's why we have, uh, that's uh, above 70 uh, in our respondent. The average age was 46.95, standard deviation of 9.95. Uh, average tenor of that is uh, average years is spent teaching university 14.68. Uh, 61.45 of this uh, of those who responded are males. 
So the, the, the remaining uh, about 30 or something uh, or females, of course, that tells us that uh, probably we have more great academics, Latino academics. 83.2 uh, married, 53.5 are parents or at least three children, 61.5 old PhD or fellowship, 29.7% have never traveled out of Nigeria. Now, why do Nigerian academics wish to emigrate out of the country? Uh, interesting results, desire, those who desire just international exposure, that look, I also need to, uh, to, to have international explosion, explosion. Uh, we, we can see that that's the highest in that category. Then intention to work abroad. For some, they just have the intention that they want to work outside the country, uh, not just for mere explosion, but they want to work. Because for, for the one with exposure, some of them could be postdoctoral uh, um, conference and all of that. But for, for this category of people, it's those who, in, who have an intention of working abroad. Then some people don't have an expectation of working abroad. Of course, we took care of that too. Then willingness to relocate. Willingness to relocate, about 30% uh, of those who responded wanted to relocate. Uh -huh. And of course, those are the Japa category. Exactly. Those who really, really want to relocate, they want to leave the country, they want to go with their family and all that. What are the factors motivating Nigerian academics to immigrate? Uh, the, the list here is those who want to follow their studies. Probably those who want to go and get HDS, we are that. Now, socioeconomic conditions of this country is the next. And of course, some academics are of the opinion that look, the socioeconomic condition of Nigeria is not good enough, and so they need to, to, to leave the country. And to experience a new life, these people are just adventurous, they want to experience a new life, life in another country, and all of that. But very, very interesting that the ISA is actually pressure from family and friends. Pressure from family and friends, which, which means there are people in the academics. Of course, you cannot uh, pretend about that. Who are, who are pressure from family members? Uh, of course, I was discussing with a colleague for, for some time now who's been saying that the wife had been giving him hell a room. That the wife just said, Look, you are just here wasting away your friends and your mates and you can all of that. And the wife keeps mounting pressure. And of course, I've also experienced some uh, people coming to my office to say, Oh, God, what are you still doing here? You are social Japan now. So pressure from family and friends is also another thing, uh, especially for colleagues who travel. Uh, they keep talking to colleagues down there to say, ah, you are still there. When are you coming over? And all of that. Now, where are the preferred immigration countries for Nigeria academics? Canada scores the highest. Yeah, people want to go to Canada. And of course, the, 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 let me put it like that. The place for Canada just started a few, a, a, a few years back. Uh, it used to be UK, US, but now Canada are actually overtaken, followed by US, uh, UK, followed, that's like uh, almost 80. Uh, then other European countries, Australia. Then some of our colleagues still want to emigrate to countries in Africa. Well, of, of course, when we begin to talk of Botswana, South Africa, even Ghana here, yeah, and all that, Arabian Gulf, and of, and of course, uh, we can see the rest there. Now, so we decided to then look at the relationship, the correlation between all these variables. Of course, we use the, uh, the, the, the social, social demographic variables as dominant variables, just to run uh, this, this correlation. And of course, we see that the immigration motive correlates positively with the, 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 the immigration wish. And of course, subjective well being correlated negatively with the immigration wish. And of course, also correlates negatively with uh, the immigration motive. Now, job burnout also cor cor correlates uh, with uh, motive, with wish. And of course, negative correlates with, with burnout. Uh, burnout of age also correlates. Uh, Mital status also. also some positive correlation, some negative correlation. Now, the interesting thing is that all these variables significantly correlate with one another, but some positively, some uh, negatively. And of course, we look at all this together and we uh, actually come up with our discussion and our conclusion. Now, most of the academics design international exposure and intend to work abroad, but not emigrate permanently. You see in that, I think that was the first slide, that I mentioned about that people wanted exposure, and that was, was the idea. So 
it, it may not be as bad as um, as we are reporting it, or has been it's been talked about. Uh, we are like people want international exposure, which means if they have this international exposure and then uh, there's funding for them to go on conferences, to go for uh, sabbatical, to go for um, with doctor and all of that, they will go and they will come back. So a whole lot of our people desire entire exposure, desire, desire to work abroad, but not to emigrate permanently. Then many academics are planning to relocate out of Nigeria, mainly due to pressure from family and friends and worsening economic crisis. Now, these were the two indices that, that, uh, that were highest in, 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 in the variables that we, we interrogated. The pressure from family and friends is actually the highest. So when we, well, of course, I will see some things, of course, some, some of these we cannot be talking about publicly, uh, that some of our colleagues emigrated, mainly because why? Their wives and their family put pressure on them. And unfortunately for some of them, uh, by the time they get there, they cannot continue as academics for one reason or the other. So, um, I mean, the wife now become a nurse or become something and the mom becomes uh, the supporting striker in, in, in the house. So, I mean, we, we should take note that um, colleagues, some, some of our colleagues are immigrating due to family uh, family and friends pressure. Then it wasn't a economic crisis. Of course, when you look at the economy of Nigeria, everybody would come to, uh, to the realization that things are not as easy as they should, should be. So people begin to think in terms of relocating. You know, uh, like they say, the grass is always greener on the other side. Well, the, whether it is actually greener or, 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 or no, uh, it's, a, it's a question of when you get there, uh, you will see, you know, someone once said that before you know the, that the giant tracks is not in, in its own, you must have dug the hole uh, to the very end. So until you get there, you cannot know whether the grass is actually greener. But then the worst economic crisis in our country is pushing colleagues to emigrate. And of course, that is, that, that is a fact. If a professor is any less than seven hundred dollars, and this professor has family and other dependents to, to cater for, then you can the professor may begin to think in terms of going abroad and making some pounds or dollars that will cushion the effect of the poverty is exposed to around it. Now, like uh, as earlier stated in that um, chat, Canada, USA, UK, the Europe are the most preferred uh, locations. Or, of course. Uh, People are going to Canada, but then the whole of people are also going to UK. In fact, the, the UK, it appears that it's easier to, to enter UK now, uh, especially with the student visa. So we will see colleagues who already have PhD applying for a uh, master's degree program in the UK uh, just to get um, uh, to get the visa, which would include the family. And in some instances, it's the wife that will apply for the master's degree. And of course, because UK now says, OK, we are going for a master's, you can come with your family. And after your program, you have been given two years extension to remain in the UK and work. Now, majority of Nigerian academics are not satisfied with their life in Nigeria. That is very true. They felt worn out and becoming disconnected from their jobs, but they hardly had bad mouth the academia. And this is where the, 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 the love for the job comes in. Now, these people are not satisfied. Many of us are not satisfied with, with our lives, given the conditions under which we work, Given the regulation that we get, we are not satisfied, and of course, because the facility to work also not there, we are easily worn out, easily burned out, and all of that. We are dis in, in a, a lot of people are disconnected from the jobs, but they are still pushing on. But then you hardly find us about matching the academia because we still have a belief in the system. We still believe that the academia is the best place for us to be, and this, it is a place where we can make our contribution and build the nations, build the people build critical human capital for our country. So we don't badmouth the academia, but then we just badmouth the conditions that we find ourselves in the academia. And of course, that's say that points to the fact that if the conditions are right, we will say we will remain here uh, to keep uh, uh, to, to keep building our nations. Also, Nigeria academics have reported lower levels of subject well-being, and our levels of job burnout are more likely to leave. They are more likely to emigrate when people come to the conclusion that their subjective well-being is low. And of course, uh, the job burnout is high. They tend to want to emigrate that, look, I, I need a visa. I need to take a visa. I need to leave this country. Uh, it, it's choking. We need to build again. Now, the Jaffa syndrome is not popular among the single. Younger 
with fewer children, recently employed, and less qualified, less qualified academics. Now, this also is very, very true. For some people in the academics, or some of us in the academics, when people say, why not be little, tell them, you know how old I am. It is at this age you want me to, 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 uh, to emigrate. For some of us who simply say, if we are taking that decision like some 15, 20, 25 years ago, to have been fine, but not now. So we, we, we saw in this study that the, the younger people are more motivated to leave. And of course, in my own university, even during this trial, we know how many young academics left. I stand lecturer, lecturer, lecturer too. They left. Because as far as they are concerned, they are still quite young. Some of them single, so no attachment that is keeping them there. So they, they will easily take decision to, to emigrate. And of course, people with fewer number of children, maybe one child, two children, at most three, for, for such people, it is easier for them to take decisions uh, to emigrate. But for people with many children, or people whose children are already in the university, 100 level, 300 level, and all of that, begin to think in terms of who do I leave this student with? Uh, and of course, those who are recently employed, of, of, they will also be willing to, to move very quickly. They will say, look, uh, like my people will say, you put one leg in the river, the crocodile, the crocodile sees that leg. You, you, you better retreat before putting the second leg. So for those who are recently employed, you just look at it. Uh, for, for some who are employed, maybe a, a month or two after, the seven months old strike started, started while we were there, they like, ah, it's better for me to leave uh, if this is what academics is what is all about. Now, academics with less international travel experience got higher on the on the Japan motives, the immigration motives. And of course, this again is understandable. They have fewer, less international travel, travel experience. So for such people, they want to see the world. And of course, whatever opportunity they have to see the world, uh, they, will, uh, they, will, they will take that. Now, the findings found support in the two theories reviewed. One, the, with the, with the, with the, with the uh, mass hierarchy of needs, we conclude that there are felt needs as stated by Maslow. And these felt needs may be perceived as not being satisfied in Nigeria. So academics emigrate to places where they feel the needs can be satisfied. So we realize that the mass hierarchy of needs support this DAPA syndrome that people are immigrating because they are fed needs, and these fed needs are not being satisfied as far as they are concerned in Nigeria, so they need to go elsewhere to satisfy the needs. Maslow said, when you need something, that particular need becomes motivating at that point in time. And of course, we know when you are motivated, uh, you need to act in a way to satisfy that uh, motivation. Now, with the, with, the, with the equity theory, academics compare their input and output or outcome with what academics in other clients earn and they perceive inequity. When you consider your salary, I mean, the, the last time that comparison was made, I don't know what, uh, what, uh, what of things in Ghana now, because I know Ghana is also passing through uh, its own store. But there was, a there's a point in time when we compared what academics end in Nigeria, I want academics in Ghana end. We realized that the gap was much. I mean, Nigeria academics were more or less doing more because we have more people in our classroom than they have over there. Same thing with South Africa, same thing with Botswana. So with, with this comparison, people, when you have a feeling of inequity, you are motivated to restore yourself to, an, to the equilibrium where you begin to feel that everything is equitable. And of course, there are certain things you do or there are certain things you can do to restore that equilibrium according to, to, to this theory. Now, one is you might attempt to reduce your inputs in order to justify the outcome. You can reduce your input and you are just saying, well, what I'm putting in now is commensurate with what I am getting. That is one way. Another way is to argue that the outcome should increase so that it will be commensurate with your input. Now, if these two scenarios are not possible, then what you can do is to walk, walk away and look for another place where your input will give you a commensurate 
output. So I can compare their input and output with what I can in other clients and assuming equity. Now, which means colleagues who are emigrating, who are emigrating will get will like to know what are they paying in, 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 in the UK, what are can we pay in the US, what are they paid in Canada, and all of that. Well, uh, whether they do the uh, the correct kind of calculation is another uh, board game entirely. But then, by this theory, uh, when you perceive inequity, you are motivated to restore balance, to go back to equilibrium, and you can do that either by reducing your input, by arguing for a better outcome, or by leaving the job entirely. Now, they put in identical effort, but get lower remuneration. I've said that earlier. Now, what I will recommend is very simple. The question is quite simple. Government and proprietors of investors should improve the condition of the investor academics. Make conditions comparable with what change in those countries academics are emigrating to. Now, we cannot run away from this because we are now in a global village. We are in an information age. By the strike of importance, people can get what is being paid in other clients and for doing the same job. And in some instances, we have also come to realize that we will do more jobs, we will do more rather than colleagues outside, outside the country. And of course, the reason for, for this is not perfect is because our class are overcrowded, because we do not have enough universities or enough higher institutions. So everybody wants to uh, come to university, and university are trying to accommodate as, as many as they can accommodate. And of course, the more we do that, the more pressure we put on academics. So when people are now running sessions, running semesters back to back, yes, they are, they are getting penal, then emigration uh, will be inevitable. So government and proprietors of university should improve the condition of the university academics, make conditions compared with sorts of things in other countries academics are emigrating to. Now, each time the, 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 the academic staff you know, in Nigeria negotiates with uh, the federal government, it's usually an operator's. You may be on it for so many months and all of that. And at the end of the day, the academy will feel shortchanged. So now it's even difficult for some of us to actually counsel uh, our colleagues, our friends, not to emigrate. When they put the statistics before you, suddenly you realize that you have nothing to counter. So if government is sure, or government knows that, look, the university is a place where critical human capital is developed, then the government should do the different by improving the condition of academics so that we can begin to retain our people, our, our very best, because we are actually losing our best. We can begin to retain our very best. And also, we can be able to attract expatriates from other, from other countries to come to Nigeria. I don't know of any federal investing today that can claim that they have lecturers from the UK, from the US, from Europe, and all of that. So like I did say as, as I went down, this uh, is work in progress, and these are preliminary uh, results from data that we have in. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, sir, for this wonderful presentation. I think uh, I enjoyed every bit of it, perhaps because uh, I'm an academic, but I believe that everybody, almost everybody on this platform is an academic, and um, we are going to have a, a nice, fruitful discussion on this paper. Thank you so much, sir, for that uh, wonderful outing. You're so welcome. I can see some hands up. People are ready to talk. I think I saw Professor Akim Akimwale first, then Emeritus Professor Sogolo, then Professor Abdallah Obadamu, and then Professor Fashogmo. So let us go in that order. Uh, all right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the speaker for at least uh, bringing back our minds to Maslonian hierarchy of uh, needs, uh, which is what we are all struggling for. But I think uh, what what is lost in the in the lecture is the motivation that people have for Japa. I was thirty five years old when I was Fulbright scholar in the United States at the University of California, and I never felt that I really want to stay there, despite the beautiful environment and uh, the salary that I was getting as a Pulbrighter. So for individual motivations, uh, really work. Last year, at the age of about 66, I was given an opportunity to work at uh, Commonwealth of Learning in Canada. I rejected it. 
uh, because uh, I, I cannot see at the age of 66 myself moving out of Nigeria and then starting all over again. So the whole idea of whether you want to get out uh, or stay in Nigeria depends on your own individual personal uh, motivation. Nasu has been screaming and shouting and going on strike about the condition that he listed has been necessary for us to, to, to remain in Nigeria, not to go out. There's nothing new there. And uh, the, the comparison with the dollar and the Naira, I think you need a greater economic analysis. $600 is nothing if you are living in the US, but 450,000 Naira is a lot if you are living in Nigeria. We, we tend to lose sight of the fact that when we do all these conversions, we, 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 we ignore the prevailing economic circumstances of the societies that these things are being applied to. Uh, and Nigerian academics earn about 450,000 Naira a month. And uh, unless you are the person with four wives and 20 children, 450,000 Naira enables to basic survival, basic survival. I didn't say it's enough, but you, you cannot compare it with earning $600 in the US because you cannot survive there with that amount of money. So I, I think there's a need to, to rework the conception of uh, the economy. I mean, Hakim is living, is staying in the US now. He'll be able to tell you whether whether the money that he's earning there it enables him to live the way he wants to, 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 to live. Finally, uh, the questionnaires that are, uh, are given out, I just wanted to know, maybe I missed that, where the questionnaires are given to Nigerians who have actually migrated outside Nigeria or were they given to people who are still in Nigeria but are willing or thinking of migrating because of what they consider to be bad circumstances? Uh, it is very critical. A person who lives out there will have likely to have a totally different perspective from a person who is still here and who wants to live. Uh, so it, it will be very interesting, very interesting to know uh, whether the, the questionnaire was given to those who are relocated. They are in Australia, they are in uh, Germany, they are in the US. They're in the UK, they're living there, they have migrated, and we are measuring their opinions. Rather than somebody who is in Nevada, or who is in BUK or ABU, and you are asking him to fill a questionnaire about whether he should migrate or not. When you discover, when you compare the two perspectives, you find that there's a radical difference. So once more, thank you very much for at least uh, bringing our attention to a very critical point. Like I said, I have to go up to the mosque, but I will be back. So yeah. don't go away. <laughs> uh, okay, Prof. Uh, probably I should just quickly respond to, to the two issues you raised because we are living for the most. Now, on the, on the issue of um, the conversion, now, the thing is, when we begin to talk in terms of equity and motivation, the Nigerian economies are collecting 450 today, and we say six, $600 is something. That man, a couple of years ago, his salary, if he does the conversion, is, is over, is, is over $1,000. Now, so if he does a conversion, the man feels within himself that I am worse off. It does not matter. Well, I, he, he feels he's worse off because two years ago, I was earning close to $2,000. Today, I'm earning less than $700. He does something to his psychology. And of course, once that thought comes to you, it affects the way you think. It affects so many things you do. And on these participants, uh, the academics that are still in Nigeria that were distributed the questionnaire to, not those who have already emigrated. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for that response. So can we hear from Professor Akim, Akim Wiley, please? Yes, good afternoon. And good afternoon. Uh, I salute uh, Professor Lakwegba, my former colleague. We were together in the Faculty of uh, the Social Sciences before I flew away from the uh, University of Ibadan. Not out of Nigeria, <laughs> but uh, to private university. So and before I flew back again to University of Lagos about 11 years ago. So maybe that's another dimension of uh, JAPA. <laughs> I JAPA from uh, University of Ibadan <clears throat> to other universities in Nigeria. So that's on a lighter uh, note. So Professor Lakwegba's uh, presentation is very fascinating, very lively and uh, realistic, interesting. I enjoyed it. And uh, because he's a psychologist, he has been able to analyze the reality from psychological perspective. So, and because I like his work, I want to advise on the theoretical framework. And possibly I may be, I may be wrong, and he will now educate me if I'm wrong, because he's in psychology, you should know better the suitability of theories. So what I'm thinking is that uh, 
the equity theory is fine. It is perfect because it's a, it's a process theory, it's a behavioral theory. But the Abraham Maslow's uh, hierarchy of need, uh, I think uh, there's a better theory that can replace uh, Abraham Maslow's theory. Because Maslow's theory is, uh, is a content theory and the decisions of uh, academics are usually based on a complex uh, behavioral uh, issue. So academics uh, consider a lot of factors before making decisions. And the, the result of this uh, presentation clearly indicated that. So subjective well-being, pressure from friends and family, our view. So Prof, I think uh, as back motivation hygiene theory will be stronger than Abraham Maslow's uh, theory to explain that uh, aspect of the of the findings, <clears throat> because basically it's like uh, there is uh, experience of uh, dissatisfaction and lack of motivation, and those two critical factors come out clear in your findings, Prof. So, in addition to that, I think you need a labor market uh, institution theory because institutional enablers or barriers mediate in the decision to migrate. Not every academic that wants to even jack is able to do so because there are institutional barriers. Some are not even interested in jack but because of this uh, family friend pressure and institutional enablers. If I have a brother in Germany who, who want me, him by all means, all he has to do is to put in place or press on buttons, get a job for me over there and you know, encourage me to come with his own institutional, whatever, whatever, everything will uh, just, uh, you know, work out. But even if I want to go and I don't have a support system over there, it becomes difficult. You know, you go through FISA regime, you go through... So, Prof, I think uh, you need to include the labor market theory to, to strengthen the theoretical framework. Equity theory, if possible, as back motivation hygiene theory and a labor market theory. So your work will just uh, move move to near perfection. So thank you, Prof. And finally, I think your recommendation, Prof, your recommendations uh, seem not to be realistic because uh, we know the current uh, economic predicament facing the Nigerian government, the macroeconomic parameters may not really allow the recommendation to, to be realistic because Okay, you said, okay, government should just uh, provide for academics uh, a kind of uh, equitable working condition. What of the capability of the government to achieve that? I think uh, we need to really interrogate uh, the helplessness of the states to make provision for its citizens, this time around academic. Our eight month salary has not been paid, not because government is not capable, but because even the political will is not there. And we, we seem to be sweeping that under the carpet. And now we are recommending the government, the same government that has been so, that have been so, I don't know what adjective to use. So Prof, I think uh, a more realistic recommendation will be required. Thank you. Thank you very much. Prof, we answer the questions or comments after everyone's comment. So sir, uh, Professor, Emeritus Professor Sogolo, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh... Director, I want to first of all congratulate you first again for your promotion. Thank uh, you. <laughs> now, uh, it's, it's, I always uh, feel very, uh, you know, excited when I see my Badon colleagues, uh, and there are many of them here. Yeah. Professor yeah. Lepeba, uh, mm -hmm. it's nice uh, seeing you. Our former VC, Professor Idowu uh, Olayika, uh, and my friend, uh, Professor Samai Lamande, they're all around, and many others. I'm, I'm happy to see you. Now, this is Jakpa. So, you, you know, the Jakpa business, or oh, it's become a business, really, uh, because we talk very much about it. It's very trendy. And uh, this, presentation is one really based on research and, and that really increases the value of what we have uh, listened to uh, today because it's based on real uh, research. We're talking about equity theories, 
and uh, talking about variables, a lot of other things that, uh, you know, uh, determine or, you know, uh, throw great light on the, the motivation to want to leave uh, uh, Nigeria at this particular uh, time. I'm happy that, uh, you know, the uh, uh, professor talked about uh, the age factor as one of those uh, variables, because it just, you know, it takes my mind back to the 90s, you know, I, I had the urge to really go to the US and, and settle there. You know, I, I started, went to Big Hampton uh, in uh, uh, New York State, you know, up north. And, uh, you know, I spent six months there, really, in the, you know, Institute for Global Studies with uh, Ali Mazuri. And after six months, I must confess, I got tired. You know, I was able to get the green card because my wife is uh, partly American, partly uh, British. So it was easy for me to get the green card. But I must say this, that for me, settling abroad was not anything that, you know, I, I didn't quite like it at all. Uh, I found that it was, or it is in Nigeria, that you find a lot of fulfillment in many ways. It's unfortunate that many people are, you know, being forced to really uh, leave this country. Otherwise, when you get to a foreign land, particularly uh, in the US, you find that the society there is quite a different thing from what you have in Nigeria. And so the fulfillment, life's fulfillment in many other respects, is not exactly the same. But of course, you must live. You must get good salary. We are going for some other reasons, uh, not because you are looking for fulfillment, but I'm saying that the social aspect of <clears throat> life, the status, the recognition, all you find here in Nigeria are not there. So a lot of people, when they go get to uh, age, certain age, get to my age now, and you begin to think when somebody says, look, you, you know, can you travel to the US? And you just say, for what for? The UK, what for? And so the, the odds, it is the economic circumstances that really push a lot of our young people to want to leave. Otherwise, I'm sure that they still find greater fulfillment uh, in Nigeria here than abroad. So I, I think that the age factor is very important and it should be uh, emphasized. But uh, it's a very uh, stimulating presentation. I congratulate uh, Professor <clears throat> Lakwewa. I'm glad that uh, you know we continue to meet. And uh, I also want to congratulate the Center of Excellence for always bringing this excitement. You know, uh, it used to be every week, but this time we are getting it uh, regularly. And uh, my friend uh, uh, Professor Abdallah Uba has left. He's gone to the mosque. I wanted to say hello to him. Thank you very much, uh, Director. Yeah. Thank you, sir. He said he's coming back. So okay. we still see him, sir. I think yeah. there was, a, is it Professor Fash Ogmon? I saw his hand up. Is he still interested in speaking? If he's not there again, then Professor Mande, then Professor Iduwo Lanyika wants to make a comment. So let us go to Professor Mande, then Professor Iduwo Lanyika. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, the center director and uh, Professor Peter Olakwegwa, thank you for an excellent presentation. I must say that uh, what you've done is basically exposing the situation that we now have today in, a, in the Nigeria academic situation. And what is key is that there are other factors responsible to this uh, JAGMA development. And uh, like Prof said, no matter what age is a very critical factor. 
You can't be at the age of 50 above and be talking about Jack Bain. What that means that there are challenges. So, but the key issue is that we first of all have to ask ourselves, what is our value system? It is our own inability not to appreciate our own value as citizens of a country. Because when you have value for yourself and you have value for your nation, there are so many things that will assist you in taking such decision. No doubt about it in your presentation, you talked about the situation whereby people jack up because of sheer pressure from the families. Yes, I totally agree with you. In fact, it has gotten to the extent that some families that are there are currently doing some menial job. You can imagine somebody who has a PhD, even an associate professor who now emigrated from Nigeria, but is now right there having challenges. So these are something that has affected not only those in the academia, but other people in other sector of our own society. There is something that I feel I should also let us know with this kind of engagement. There is this activity by the technical aid corps. It is also now a channel whereby people now emigrate outside this country and when they get out, they find it difficult to come back. Instead of respecting to the contract of engagement. So it is something that we need to look at it clearly and see how we can move on into that. And then because of the way things are, your presentation is quite clear, but I would have loved to get some recommendation that has to do with applicable situation. Because the era we are today, because talking about the triple helix model, with these challenges, what are the actions that should be taken? The academia has made some exposition, which is what you have done. What do we expect the industry to do? What do we expect the government to do? And indeed, Professor Akimwale talked about, yes, the government we have today is the one that there are a lot of challenges and all that. Some people been in the system for the past eight months or even having stayed for eight months without salary and no comment, nothing is missing about that. So I would want a situation whereby there should be major steps to be taken in order to resolve some of these identified challenges. But no matter what like we are now talking about, being citizen driven, being proactive and being, having the pride of your country is very, very important. But it is the age factor. Somebody that is within the age of 35, 40 can probably have that kind of adventure. Not those that are beyond those years to do that kind of a thing. Generally speaking, I commend you for an excellent presentation, but I would want a situation whereby the recommendation should be action stated so that the sectors to implement those things can now have an implementable decision. Thank you so much and may God bless. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mande, for that uh, contribution. And so let us have uh, Professor Iduwo Lanyinka to make his comments. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, uh, Coordinator. Again, uh, I joined uh, Professor Shokulu, our boss, to congratulate you on your elevation to full professor. I, I, I think I want, you, what thing one can say about the lecture presented by Professor Olapigba is that it's not controversial. I mean, in terms of uh, deductions. I mean, of course, he, I also responded to this uh, questionnaire. And I'm 65 years old. So it's not like that we emigrate. If when I completed, <laughs> my, I completed my PhD at the age of 30 in UK, I didn't stay back. So it'd be odd for me, 35 years old in until now, so I want to go back to that same uh, environment. But, but again, uh, even what I proposed, I might learn this age. I mean, it's also, but it's, it's not good. The truth of the matter is that uh, I was I offered economics as a subject in secondary school, and I remember my old uh, uh, economics teacher teaching us. I mean, saying that the uh, movement of labor is not as fluid as is theoretically assumed. So if I mean if I don't, I mean for purpose of the argument, I'm earning six hundred dollars or seven hundred dollars. It's not likely that I will go. To, I would like to go to Ghana permanently, even if you are going to offer me two thousand dollars. For reasons that have been explained at my age and all that. And also, I think the title of the presentation is Brain Train or Brain Gain. And I listen, I look at the, one of the slides presented by Professor Solar Piva when he was uh, trying to define a brain drain. Say that um, migration of skilled uh, human resources. I think in this context, it's going to be brain drain 
for us in Nigeria because it's moving in one direction. It's like our people who are living here, they go on one way ticket, they never intended to come back. So uh, whether it is great is, of course, it's going to be great to benefit in the country. I mean, it gave us many slides to show that people now, uh, Canada is now the in thing and the rest of them, even uh, some African countries like uh, Australia. I think the factors are also very clear. I, I think just to say that whether it is brain green or brain green, the truth is it is brain circulation. It's moving from one place to the other. People, I'm sure even in UK, people still move to US, but it, what proportion of Americans wants to go to UK? So Americans are also go to UK for whatever reasons, decide to stay permanently in, in UK. But I think the problem we have on our hands is that, this, of course, this, uh, Study is limited to academics. You also had it about uh, other doctors. In fact, there was a poster, a cartoon that I saw overnight that uh, have so many Nigerian doctors have been registered in the UK. Just like you rightly said, how many uh, British doctors are coming to Nigeria? Of course, if the condition is, is right and we're ready to pay them, they would also like to come. So I think the crisis we have is that uh, we lose people to other countries, but they don't want to come back here. It's the same thing when you talk of even the uh, international students. Uh, it's not a uh, rocket science. We, we used to have uh, many students from uh, Ghana, from uh, Cameroon. When, when I was on the graduate city, but we had a few Cameroonians. But now, if your university is closed for half of the time, so you are not likely to attract people even from neighboring African countries, not to talk of uh, America. I think the context in which we are presented it is fairly straightforward. But my own contribution as a, I mean, as a citizen is to say that the government has a critical role to play in this. I mean, it's basically a government decision. That's why it's a government is, uh, politics is superior to economics. Because it's government that we decide, what do we want? Is it okay for you to have, I mean, there was a time uh, the provost of our College of Medicine said they were doing their 38th anniversary of when they graduated from the medical school. It's like two thirds of those people in that set, they have left the shores of our great country, Nigeria. So is that, if you want that one to continue, but for them to even want to come back, is a problem. It's just like membership of a secret uh, court. Because the point has made that those who go abroad, it's not as if it's also easy for them. But it's like a secret court, membership of secret court. Those who are inside, they want to get out. But those who are outside, they also want to get in. So all we need to do is to make sure people will always leave. I mean, that's why at times people say, why do some people send their children abroad to go and study? Of course, I send my children abroad. But even government is sending people abroad. So why is it now a crime for a citizen to send his own children abroad abroad? So I've not committed a crime. What government itself is making conscious effort to send people abroad for PhD for MSc. So if I have that for my media income, I send my child to Europe or America. So I don't see any crime in it. But I think it's just the quality of it. I should just uh, leave the, I mean, yield the grant for others to bring their contributions. So I think it's a very interesting topic, but the conversation should come. I think government has a role to play, the executive and also the, even the National Assembly. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you very much, sir, for that contribution. And on my own part, I want to also join people to say age as a factor of movement is very important. However, even with age, I do believe that many people will still want to go for temporary migration because you know that you have temporary one and we have permanent one. And in temporary migration, you could go for two, three years and come back because people need capital and need to put some things on. Some people are retiring, they don't even, they will, they will retire when, you know, like when people are in their sixties, we are saying they are too old or 56 or whatever. But when they look back, they have nothing to show to retire on. The salaries they are going to even get when they retire, they are not certain that it's going to come on time. So some people may be, feel very inclined to going for a short while and coming back. And those people, that kind of migration is going to be common among those age group we are saying cannot be thinking of migration or may not be good to be thinking of migration at this time. The Japa ones that really go and say they are going for real no more to this country are the youths, mainly those people in their 35, 40, 45. But the old ones, some of them will still surely come back, but they want to go and make money which they cannot see in their country. We know that times are hard. And when we finish talking here, people go back, they cannot live in the type of homes they want to live in. They are still living in rented accommodation at 60, 65. And they have seen somebody saying, come and do what you are doing in your country, not to go and wash gutters or go and wash cups, but to come and lecture 
and they want to have some capital, I think we should look at that angle. Thank you very much. And for now, I don't think I can see any hand up. Can I just make a point? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, yes. you can. Yes, I think your uh, the intention when you when you leave, when you talk back, uh, it's not always fulfilled when you get there. The situation, most cases, is different. You find that you get in there, uh, things are not what you expected. And um, the longer you stay there, the more difficult it is for you to want to return. Because you find, particularly in Nigeria, you find that uh, those who left, some of our colleagues who left in the 70s and so forth, got trapped in the, particularly in the US. When you get to the US, you are lured into the lifestyle there. You settle with your family and you find your day-to-day -day living very, you know, exciting. You're getting everything. So planning ahead becomes difficult. And most people who stay in there after about 10 to 15 years, find that the returning will become a, a problem. Because first, the colleagues they left behind have gone ahead, you know, uh, developed, you know, far more than they, they have. Most of them, you know, find that they don't have even any or, or houses at home. So when they come back, they become strangers. And uh, so it makes it more and more difficult for them to return. I just want to correct that point. It's, it's not easy for you to say, I want to go for two years, three years, and I, I return. You find that you, you, <laughs> returning can be difficult. Thank you. <laughs> Trying to speak. So over to you, sir. Professor Fashion, over to you. Uh, I want to congratulate my, my prof for the, for the beautiful presentation. Because uh, to be precise, this uh, work is 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 in line with my uh, my ongoing PhD work, and uh, I have some other, I have some facts that can as well add to what he has said, because on my own part I have conducted series of uh, interview. Even I even got to a university, to be precise, one of the College of Medicine. A whole department, all the academic staff there, they've left. And even the, the, the provost of the college was telling me that even when the NUC, that they are expecting NUC and you could just imagine what the, the report of the NUC is going to be. And in the course of my own, my interview, conducting interview with uh, medical personnel, I mean medical lecturers and engineering and tech, I discovered that the age factor which most speakers have actually emphasized on has been a germane factor. I spoke with a lot of professors as regards this. Majority of them actually have found the word, I mean, the, that age as a germane uh, issue for the JAPA syndrome. But sir, uh, the, the, I want to quickly ship, ship in something as regards the theories that were adopted for the study. I, I, want, to, I want us to look at the, uh, the social theory. The, the social theory actually emphasizes some factors that in as much those factors are still in existence, the brain drain will still continue. And these factors are weight differentials, differences in political atmosphere, uh, uh, cost of living and the likes. So I want Prof to, as he has presented it and the conclusion and that of the recommendation actually covers that. But I still want to start from his pool of uh, knowledge as regards some other factors that could be identified and that could be explained for, because this is a serious issue. Like I've said, I've gone to almost six or seven universities now, University of Ibadan inclusive. And if you visit the College of Medicine and some part of tech, you know that the brain drain is a serious problem in the Nigeria University. So that is yes, my thank you very submission. Much. Thank you, my professor. Uh, please, uh, there's one, uh, is it Professor Adikwit Esonya? Please, me quickly make your point. And I also want to say there's an infinite note 
we always prefer names and we cannot call infinite notes to speak because uh, there's no name there. Uh, Please uh, kindly put your name, then you uh, may speak. Yeah. After so, I think we test yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, good uh, afternoon to everybody in the house. And uh, let me join others to say, I mean, uh, to greet my uh, erudite professor, the presenter, in person of uh, Professor or lack of that. So the areas where I just have, I mean, um, feelings is the application of the uh, hierarchy needs of the Abraham Maslow. We will discover that in most cases, Abraham Maslow's theory may not be applicable, particularly to our peoples in the Northeast area of the Nigeria. In most cases, you will see that they want to satisfy the security needs before physiological needs. So in that sense, I will, have, uh, I will suggest that the uh, Professor Lakbegba should just, I mean, think about uh, applying another theory that will be more suitable, you understand? So that our uh, people that, are, that want to leave the country uh, because of insecurity could also participate in that uh, studies. Then uh, I don't know whether I heard well, there was a point where you were made in, um, uh, mentioning uh, that Nigeria does not have, I mean, enough universities. I don't know whether I heard you well. But uh, to me, I think we have even more than enough, but we don't have a viable ones. Thank you very much, sir. God bless you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, now we allow, um, we allow our speak, presenter to speak. Sorry, we like to identify people with their names. So over to you, presenter, sir, to comment. Thank you very much, uh, uh, the professor and director. Uh, well, um, let, let me start with um, Professor Akimwale from Unilag, who jumped from UI to Paris University and back to Unilag. <laughs> well, he, he, he spoke about the, uh, the theories and all of that. Those, comments are well taken. I, I would just like uh, you to note, like I did say earlier, that this work in progress, and that um, from conception to presentation now, uh, is just two weeks. And I did say that this is just a preliminary uh, report from that story. So we have not really, really interrogated that data deep enough. When I got this invitation, I decided to present something on migration, because I'm coming to the center of migration, why should I present something that is um, at variance with what they do there? So I conceptualized this study, and so we spent two weeks, and like uh, Professor Lainka said, uh, he was one of the people that responded to the questionnaire, like some other people on this. So your, your points are well taken, um, Professor Akinwale, we would, as we go on in the study, we would um, we'll continue to refine it and all of that. Uh, as a recommendation, fine. Also, because the data are not fully in, are not fully integrated, uh, interpreted. Uh, as we go on, we'll come up with more German and very um, uh, facts-driven uh, recommendation. Uh, our living ancestor, Professor Gulu. Well, th thank you very much, Prof, for your very kind words and for your comment. You, you see, when we were talking, sir, it, it occurred to me again that in your days, in your days, and the that I really followed you. Immediately, those who studied abroad, immediately they finish their PhD, they will come home. I remember late Professor Abumiri telling us that, look, the day he defended his thesis in the UK, he left on Nigeria the following day, that they sent the certificate to him. Why? Because the condition at home then was comparable to the condition in those places where you studied. The now was strong and all of that, so the material to come there was, was there. But now people are looking for a way to escape, to just go and, um, and, and, and forget about Niger. So these are the issues. So I agree with you. And of course, you've also validated uh, what you found in, in terms of the age, that the younger people are the ones who are living and all of that. And then you, you, you mentioned something about fulfillment. People are looking for fulfillment. And wherever they find it, they will go for it. Where, where they think the fulfillment is, they end up being a mirage. Because I, I think one of the, after we've done with this study, one of the things I would also like to get into is to actually conduct a study among, among uh, people who had emigrated. 
to, to document their experiences over there. Because I have a suspicion that what they, they, they thought they would get are actually not what uh, they are getting. And Professor Sokolo raised the point, which is something I've been telling people, that our people who had traveled out of this country 10, 15, 20 years ago, and they are not really, really coming home. They are not coming home because they are stranded. They are stranded, the system over there are trapped them. The, the word, probably use the word trap. So we need to, to, to engage. So fulfillment is actually a motivating factor. People want to, people have their dreams. And so if those, those dreams are not being fulfilled here, yes. uh, they, want, they want to move. Well, my, my, my friend and brother, Professor, uh, uh, Professor Mandy, uh, thank you for your kind words and all that. And I've, also, I agree with you on the issue of what our core values are. But then the thing about our value is that you may hold a value there. You may hold a value very, very dear. But if there are alternative circumstances, environmental circumstances that are over, over, over behind it and not, not allowing you even to express those values which you're expressing, at some point in time, we may begin to compromise those. So some of our people are leaving. Uh, probably it's because there are circumstances that is making it difficult for them to express themselves and to aspire to achieve what they, 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 uh, they, they hope to achieve. Of course, you also mentioned uh, that the technical aid call is another route now that people are taking to Japan. Well, again, on a combination, like I said, as we, as we continue, we will uh, we'll give more data during the recommendation. Uh, Professor Doloinka, thank you very much more for joining and thank you for responding to our questionnaire and for what you said here today. Uh, Prof also spoke in terms of the currency conversion thing. And uh, what I could put down there is that, well, we are talking of the economic versus the psychology of currency conversion. Now, if you begin to talk in terms of economic indices, that's why we begin to talk about what $600 can do in the US and what can do in Nigeria. But when you, con when you consider the psychology of things, of it, which is individual thing now, that will motivate you to take certain decision. If you remember that your salary was worth 2,000 naira some years back, and that same salary is worth 1,000 naira, uh, less than 1,000 naira now, it does something to you. And again, the world we are in today, you know, as an academic, there are transactions you want to make in dollars, spending your personal money. Maybe there's a book you need to buy online. Maybe there's a conference you need to pay for online. Now, that is when you suddenly realize that the economic interpretation of the conversion may not really work now. Because you just realize that a, a conference that you could pay for with your salary three, four, five years ago. Now, your salary had increased in Nigeria. But that increased salary can no longer pay for the conference that you're able to pay for easily five years back. That is when the problem comes in. So we, we are talking not, not just in terms of the amount of money, but really in terms of the purchasing power, especially when you have to purchase something outside of income. So we, we can consider the economic implication, but even the psychological thing, I'm more interested in that because I'm a, I'm a psychologist. And thank for the word you use, Professor Langer, the, the word brain circulation. In fact, I, I need to go and look at it again. And of course, if, if I get it correctly, in a situation, if someone from the UK moves to the US, we can call it brain circulation. Because it's not moving to the US because, um, because of poverty or because of anything or because uh, it doesn't have um, resources to work with and all of that. Probably it needs a change of environment, it needs, it, it needs fresh challenges. Such a person can move. And of course, as someone is moving from the UK to US, another person is moving from the US to the UK. So brain begins to circulate. But in Nigeria today, what we have is one-way traffic. Brains are moving from Nigeria to the UK. Brains are moving from Nigeria to the US. So that to us is brain drain. We are being drained and we need to look at it. Uh, and of course, I like your analogy of the circuit court thing. And that's why I said, I, I will also be interested in studying the experiences of migrants over there. Because you use the analogy of, of the circuit court. Those who are members of the circuit court who are inside, they are looking for a way to go out because their experiences within the, the, the court were various with their expectations. And so they want to move out. But then those who are looking from outside, I say, I want to join them. I, I think that explains, that explains our, our, our situation now because we, we still know a couple of people who, in the UK who are saying, look, boy, it is not as good as uh, they make it uh, to be. Mr. Fashion, thank you for, for, for your comments. Again, 
the social theory you talked about, you are, you are very correct. And of course, we made allusion to it about the causes of, uh, of, uh, of JAPA in, in terms of uh, political problems, which are not about them. And uh, we'll talk more about, about them. Uh, Director, thank you also. You also brought in one temporary migration. Uh, and of course, I talk in terms of temporary migration uh, that people want to move. Well, before now, that, I, I will agree with that. But with the way people, we are approaching the Japan thing now, uh, the temporary the temporary migration or so want to, uh, of course, you see, migration has always been with us. And as academics, we have only migrated. But how were we migrating before? We we're migrating in terms of going for conferences, going for short courses, going for sabbatical leave, going to activity. And of course, we had such opportunities where we we're moving. So we have people who move, in fact, on a leave of absence. You go to the UK, spend two years, spend three years, come back. That, that is fine. But for those who are, who are talking of Japan now, they are not talking of going, going to work for three, four. Do you know, there's another dimension to it. We've seen retired colleagues who are relocating. I mean, at 70, they retired. I, I know one or two uh, around here who retired and relocated with the wife. So we begin to ask ourselves, what, to what end? So that means there are issues within our environment that are forcing people out. A whole number of people are living. They are not happy living. But there are issues here forcing them to, to move. Uh, well, um, um, I think someone, OK, it was, um, Professor Akimali was talking that the uh, asking government to do it is not realistic. It is realistic. It is government that will take the bull by the and put in place a lively environment to retain people. If government is aligned to its, to its responsibility, the government should notice a trend that is dangerous. Now, we, we, we've agreed here today, from data and from comments of people, that the younger ones are the ones moving. Now, a time will come within the academics that there's going to be a generational gap. When you just look at the academics and just realize that, look, there's a gap between a particular generation and another generation. And one of the people moving, the very best will be the one that the system abroad will attract. So which means those who are just barely managing the, the academics are the ones who retain. So we need to teach our children. So we need to look at all of this. Uh, Mr. Adegbita, thank you. Maslow has a short, Arak uh, uh, has a short comments. And like I said, this is a work in progress. And of course, we need to take the strong part of, of Maslow to explain certain things. Not that we agree with everything that, of course, one of the criticism of, 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 of Maslow's Maslow theory is that those things Maslow has cast in iron are actually not cast in iron in reality that an individual could actually skip one, two steps, depending on what is motivating at that point in time. Now, the last point here is you say you, you, you do not agree that we don't have enough universities in, universities in Nigeria. I, I want to plead with you to agree. And I'll give you just one simple assignment to do. Just look at how many people write sit for jam exam every year. And look at how many JAM is able to admit. I, I think JAM is admitting less than 15%, less than 15% of those who apply. So the question is, where do you ask others to go? We are talking of a population, a country with a population of about 200 million. And a larger portion of that population is looking for placement in the university. So we do not have enough university, as it were, because we need to see how many do we. You see, it is because, again, because investors have not been taken, well, well, well taken care of. The, the facilities are not expanding. But then you have people who want to come to the university. Just look at the, 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 the population increase in Nigeria. I mean, we are just, we are just multiplying. I want to take care of all of those. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you very much. But uh, I just want to seek your indulgence. There are two people who have raised up their hands since, and uh, we want to give them opportunity. But just to quickly respond to the last point, sir, of there are enough universities in Nigeria. I strongly agree with you that many people write jam and they don't get admission. These universities in Nigeria, you are talking, uh, the person is talking about that are enough, are probably private universities, which the people cannot afford to pay for. But the government universities are not enough. So maybe we should qualify. There are okay. not enough government universities, universities in Nigeria, but the private ones are left for the rich. Sorry, my own opinion. So uh, let me quickly call uh, 
uh, is it Dr. Grace Adju, Adejumo? Professor Grace Adejumo. Okay, Professor Grace Adejumo, followed by Professor Tijani. Two, two minutes because we are really running out of time to make their comments. Thank you. So very much, uh, the director. And uh, I want to thank the presenter for an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, as has generally been uh, pointed out in this uh, presentation, and by uh, other people have commented, the majority of people Japan uh, are people who are uh, what we know, we can categorize as, as people in their emerging adulthood stage. And developmentally, these people are in their emerging adulthood uh, stage, have developmental tasks, which include career, uh, satisfaction, they want to be satisfied with their career, they want to be fulfilled, they want to get married. And there are other social pressures around in the country. And because of the lopsided uh, conditions in our country, whereby uh, policy has not really taken care of these, the needs and the values of this category of, of people you have, so many of them looking in search and in search for these values, these needs to be meet, to be met in other parts of the world. And that is just so this study for me has done a good job, even though it's a preliminary study, has done a good job to provide you know a database shedding light to the issue of policy. You know, so what is uh, wrong with our policy in Nigeria? That yes, we have institutions of learning who are supposed to uh, make provision for admission, and then in the in the in, in the uh, organizational uh, in the industries that are supposed to get employed or we develop uh, them uh, to, to, to become entrepreneurs. And we have a lot of challenges. Of course, those who are entrepreneurs who establish businesses, they also have serious challenges as we speak in our country. So the issue of people moving out, they move out because of the value system they have and because of the needs that they, that need to be met in their lives. So when they get to wherever they go to, they quickly, some of them adjust, some of them don't. But the, 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 the problem, as has been mentioned, is that there is no system that helps them to come back if they want to come back. So finally, what we get is, is just a brain drain and not a brain gain. So I, I really want to uh, suggest that this this study as it has shed light on the the age group age group that is actually uh, involved in this um, in this uh, jackpine uh, jackpine thing. It, it means that government, the attention of government and other organizations is being is being uh, is being called up. Yes, these are the people who will hold Nigeria. Uh, and make Nigeria strong tomorrow. Those are the people who are living now. And we need to, to, uh, to, 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 to our attention to be pointed to that so that we keep them, we motivate them, we meet their values, and so they stay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. So, Professor Tijani, please, the last but not the least. Can yes, you I, I, will, I will be very, very brief. Let me start with uh, Professor Adi Jones. Uh, uh, conclusion, uh, particularly with age, uh, we need to do an empirical study, and I'm advising Dr. Lakbegba, this is well, uh, to because I have a data, and I can tell you that in fact, most of the doctoral and even master students on Ted Fund Morgan Agreement are in their fifties. And I know of so many, not within the age bracket of 20, late 20s and 30s that want to jackpot or have jackpot 
using utilizing the policies available legally. But let me go back to this enab enabling environment that uh, the professor also mentioned. Uh, we need an en enabling environment. As he was speaking, pardon me for joining late. You know my errand uh, early early morning uh, during the week. I checked my pay slip last April 1991. I was a lecturer too. My pay slip was, let me be factual so that I can share this with you. We'll get to the bus stop. My gross is uh, 1,404 naira 56 kobo. 1,000, this is April 1991, pay advice, Lagos State University, Badagri. I left Lasso on Commonwealth Scholarship, 1994. 1997, I returned. For three months, I could not enter my own office. Three good months. I was arboring between the gate men and Baba at uh, the main gate and the library. Why? You know, so we have to look at some of those things. Of course, at the end of the day, I have to pay them off and return. Most are not doing that. That is why I was able to come back as a visiting professor in 2011, okay? And then I spent another eight years volunteering, giving up dollar salary in Nigeria. Now, let me now tell you that we need to continue this conversation. If this thing uh, cut off is because I have to drive to the bus stop. You see, the, the issue is so complex. It is so complex that we cannot identify one push, one pull factor as being responsible for the current situation. As of today, we have what we call EBH2 in, in the United States. And of course, the, the British have their own variation of that. You can, even with your masters and skill, leave and be here legally, be any mm -hmm. part of the world legally. So what enabling environment overseas? Those are some of the things we have to look into to really be able to find solution. If our research is about solution, not just identifying, uh, what do you call it, the causes and blame games. So I will rest my case. I'm, I'm interested in continuing this, you know. Yes. It's a very complex one, very interesting. And I thank Professor Olakwega for the audacity to present looking at it both empirically ethnographically as a professor at Damu, we are admonitious and then based on reality as a professor. Okay, thank you very prof. much. We thank you, admonitious. Prof. Thank you so the much. Comments okay. are quite appreciated. So Professor Olakwe, we have kindly comment to the last two speakers and general uh, summary of your presentation so that uh, we can call it a day. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Director. Uh, well, just to appreciate um, Professor Grace Adejumo for a comment. Uh, as a matter of fact, Professor Grace Adejumo, Adejumo retired from my department just uh, last year. Uh, she's been a very wonderful colleague. So I, I, I point I take it, I mean, it's in line with what uh, we, we've seen. Eh? And of course, she had also mentioned that um, government, we should rethink our policies to retain the youth. I mean, the, 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 the focus of any, any government is to make sure that uh, there are no additional gap in, uh, in, in the country. And of course, thank you, uh, Professor Tijani, uh, for, for, your, for your kind words and for sharing your experiences with us. Of course, uh, there should be no blame games. We should look at the factors uh, precipitating uh, this kind of one-way immigration. And of course, look for a way uh, to retain uh, our, our very best in our country. No blame game, nobody's to be blamed, but we should all together uh, look for solution to our problems. Well, once again, let me appreciate the National Open University. Let me appreciate the Center of Excellence and Director Professor uh, Aneto.
for inviting me, for giving me this platform uh, to share my thoughts. Again, this is a preliminary uh, finding from what you uh, motivated me to do. We'll continue the conversation like President Janice, Janice said. Uh, we'll get in more data, we'll analyze our data, and we'll uh, push the work out. Uh, of course, uh, the conversation must continue. We have no other country, and of course, uh, we must be able uh, to position our country in such a way that we can also attract brains from other countries, from other continents, to come into our country and uh, develop uh, the, uh, our investment system and the country in general. Once again, thank you very much uh, for having me. And thank, thank all you. our instructors from here and there. God bless you. Thank you very much. We are very happy that uh, you came to share your knowledge with us. We really appreciate your presence here this afternoon. And I think uh, most of us have learned one or two things. I just want to quickly correct one thing that this center is center of migration, it's a center of excellence in migration and global studies. It's like that part is always silent. When we invite people, we tell them, this is our center. Pick any topic of your choice and talk to us. Everybody thinks it's limited to migration. Well, it's not. It is, there's also global studies aspect. So what I'm saying this is that there are some people on this platform who may want to also come and speak with us and not necessarily on migration. And they, I don't want them to feel they are doing something wrong or inadequate, that they are very much welcome to take any issue, any topical issue and discuss with us here, anything that can promote knowledge and that can promote uh, this kind of uh, uh, debate we've had this afternoon, this kind of input, this kind of contributions. You can see that um, it's a very good topic, yes, and that is why we are able to have many contributions, many people saying their opinions. But however, we want more, even in the global studies aspect of this uh, mandate that the center has. So we really want to thank you. And I want to tell you, sir, Professor Lackberg, but that we would want you to complete your research, write it up and present it to this journal. We are so many, uh, we, this center, in our journal, our International Journal for Migration and Global Studies, where I told you at the beginning that we are already in volume three and uh, issue mm -hmm. one. So even if it doesn't go with issue one, it can come with issue two because we have two issues in a year. So we'll be waiting to receive that paper and I will make sure I keep reminding you about it because we want to publish that. Thank you very much. So don't mind me when I keep bothering you. And I want to say, please, we want more people to come. Just say your interest and you, I, I will just get across to the person if you have anybody for me who will want to present on this platform. We appreciate you. We thank you. We thank our eminent professors who have been made, able to contribute a lot to this uh, discourse and have made today a very pleasant one. Thank you so much. And I think uh, it's worth the time we have spent. We are we will be here now for almost two hours. And I think uh, we are we are not even feeling it because we are doing something meaningful. Thank you so much. And I want to call it a day. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.